November 18th, 1987. That's right. My name is Joe Todd. This is an interview with Mildred Roth Smith in Ada, Oklahoma. Right. Ma'am, where were you born? I was born at Roth, IT, in 1886. What month and what month and day? November 30th. Soon have a birthday. That's the reason I said I was 91. I'll be 91. And you're born? The 30th eight, of November. 1896. 1896. Who was your father? Joseph Tompkin Raw. And your mother? My mother was Mary Jane McGallion. How do you spell McGallion? M C G A L L I A N. And where were your parents from? My mother was from Miss Jackson, Mississippi, and Joe Rolfe was born in uh, uh, I believe St. Joe, Missouri. Anyway, St. Joe or Carthage. Is there Carthage, Missouri? Yes, ma'am, it is. Well, oh well, it's one of those in that area. Yeah. What type of work did your father do? He was a uh, pioneer cattleman, a wealthy cattleman. When did your parents come to Oklahoma or come to Indian Territory? He um, he lived south of Ardmore. For uh, oh I don't know and, and he was married he, he married three times and he he settled there and had a ranch here, south of Ardmore and he had five brothers and one brother was Alvy Roth who built the first house in Ardmore and my father built the first large ranch south of Ardmore south kind of east. And he was married to Anna Wall, who was a, an uh, Indian. Her father was David Wall, who was a full-blood Indian. And uh, that gave, he had five children with this wife, and that gave him Indian rights. So he had many sections of land there from Indian rights. And otherwise, white men at that time couldn't uh, buy, you know, have land. But... Uh, but Anna died at an early age and left him with those five children. And uh, he had a very prosperous uh, ranch. So he sold his ranching land and ranch there and drove these 25 head of cattle from uh, Cook County near Gainesville, 10 miles north of Gainesville, Texas and drove them to uh, Pontotoc, southern Pontotoc County, which now is Raw, Oklahoma. And uh, he settled there, and uh, I have pictures of the ranch and things like that. So uh, then he built a, a five-room log house, which was very fashionable in those days. And uh, they, it was the only uh, modern house of those times, you know. And uh, there he married again. He remarried uh, Lillian uh, oh, what is Cushman, Lillian Cushman, the second, and one son was born. That makes him six children. And that's Tom Roth. And Tom Roth lived here and was uh, a uh, super uh, director or something in charge, uh, district uh, manager of Armour Company for 30, about 30 or 35 years. He retired from Armour Company. And uh, his wife still lives here, Joe Rolfe on King's Row. And um, so he had, the, these were all small children. He had then six small children. Then he met my mother, and my mother, were, they were tenant farmers, and they, uh, 
leased this land, or I don't know how they did, but they had a little farm joining my father's uh, estate. And uh, he met her one day while he was riding around on his big horse. And he was, she was quite young. She was hardly 16. And um, he, of course, fell in love with her. And I'm glad he did. And um, he later married him. Well, in Mississippi at that time, she had very little education. None, none practically. And they lived in that delta where there were no schools, no opportunities. And um, she could do, uh, neither read nor write. And uh, so, but he married, they married. What did they meet? When did they meet? Yes, ma'am. In the 19, in, um, in uh, 18 and uh, 18 and 90, about 1899, closer to 900. And, um, now, did they meet in Indian Territory? They met it, they lived 15 miles, uh, joining my father's ranch. So her family had moved from Mississippi. To they had moved from Mississippi. Jackson, Mississippi area, down in there. And uh, he met her while he was out in the, among the cattle. And uh, she was out playing, I, she and her sister. And they were barefooted, you know, how you go barefooted. I mean, you don't know, but you read. And uh, they were, they, so they ran home. And he went to, followed them. And she crawled under the bed. And the mother got her out from under the bed and thought that's the way my father met her. And he met the mother. And of course, they were very impressed with this wealthy rancher, you know. And uh, grandfather was a Scotch Irishman, and he was pleased that his daughter. Uh, and so they courted around and got married in the. The latter part of uh, 1800, I don't, re it, I have it in the book, but I just can't recall it, but it's close to that. And uh, then their marriage, as I say, he built this uh, house then, and by this third wife, he had eight, uh, eight children, eight more children, including me. And. Uh, they were eight of us. Eight children was born to my mother. And uh, so we, of course, we lived at Rolfe until here came the cattle crash, kind of like the stock market now. It affected the cattlemen just about like the, uh, uh, the crash of the 30s, you know. And so that just knocked him him out financially because the cattle would sell 25 cents a head. He, you know, he would tell these stories. What year was this? What year was it? Oh, that, that was uh, um, around 1900 that they had the crash came. Uh, I have a, in my, some of my collections, I have some of the stock market prices, you know, and things like that, that he'd get. But he just then began, and he's a very generous man to give big, as it writes in this historical magazine, said that he was generous to a fault. He just gave so much away. Then he began to get uh, without money, you know. Couldn't get anything for his cattle, and that's all he'd ever done. And uh, so then he kind of, leaned toward real estate. He didn't do anything but buy and sell, buy and sell, you know. And by um, the last thing that he owned, that he purchased, was on Pennington. He bought the old cotton gin near Reagan. And uh, that was in 19, around 1911 and 12. And, um, of course, we were just getting up then ready for our education. And um, some of us 
came back to Rolf, you know, and went to school because they only had a grade school in Reagan. So but then some of us went to a convent, you know. He sent all of his children, the, the first wife, to, to a boarding school, you know. And so we did that our, while we lived at Reagan, and I become, I finished high school, and uh, I uh, entered training, nurse training. Did you attend the convent? Yes, I attended convent at St. Mary's. Is that in? Sherman, Texas. Sherman, Texas. And my sister Ruth, and my sister Betty, and my sister Pearl. Tell me about the convent. Well, I, I have a picture of it. It's just fantastic. Uh, the outstanding thing that I think of, it sounds very, they were so modest, you know, and, and religious. We just got deep religious training. And uh, it's just all together from the Catholic Church of today. The Catholic Church has just advanced immensely. You know, you used to have all this on your head. You know, something on your head. You had to have, the, you, your prayers came from a prayer book rather than from a uh, volunteer out of your heart. And uh, I just uh, sit and see the, the great changes come over. And they were over modest. And I think that, uh, the church is yet over modest. Uh, uh, you know, uh, now, in, in, we used to, we used children, uh, oh, I guess I was seven or eight years old, but they would uh, give us a bath. We'd take baths, but we'd have to wear dark slips, you know, so they, you, you can't see anything or be enticed in any way or things. But, and now those things, uh, we think, uh, uh, it's difficult for me to see the modern uh, uh, sex life. It's very difficult for me. And uh, but I read a lot still, and I I think that it's like the pendulum. I think it went too far. That's just like the, the Catholic training. I think they they were too modest. Now they're just a little too. Uh, too immodest, and uh, but I don't know. I I still lean toward this modern. Uh, I know that they just talk about drugs and all, but I I think the generation now, the younger ones, are are intelligently, uh, not, maybe not so much intelligent, but they're better educated. They're just so much better educated. And the children seem smarter. And I've had a great deal of nursing, was chief nurse of the children's board. In the veterans, we had 25 boys and 25 girls from one from one year to 18, whose fathers were um, tuberculosis from the war. They came home with primary tuberculosis and. Then they married, and here their family were subject, you know, to TB. So these children were, uh, uh, this hospital was set up for them. Is this hospital in Sulphur? Yeah, yes. When was that organized? Uh, that was um, organized in 19 and um, 1935. And it was one of the greatest works that I, I, I say in during my time, because these children all were rather poor. Their, their parents had come home, and then depression came on, you know. And there's so many men came with TB that the state built a, a TB hospital. Let me back up and ask what classes did you take at St. Mary's? What did your classes consist of? What, Page five. what type of classes did you have at St. Mary's in Sherman? Oh, oh, what type of class? Well, we had a regular uh, uh, primary girl, you know, 
primary grade. I only went into the primary grades. I didn't go as after I was older. But uh, we had uh, lots of uh, religious. Who was head of the convent? I just, uh, I don't know. It was St. Mary's, St. Mary's convent. But I can't tell you. Did I you, can't tell you. Did your father ever talk about Billy Washington? Gary Washington. Billy Washington. No. Lived near Marietta, south of Barnmore. No. He was a big cattleman down there. Oh, yes, yes. Yes, yes. yes. He was big. Yeah, my father. He and, oh, uh, it's in my book, uh, we're partners. He, he, He's mentioned in, in there, yeah. What did uh, he What did he tell you about Billy Washington? What kind of man was he? Well, the man he men he associated with, I mean, were interested in cattle, were great men, and wealthy men. Now, as well as I remember, he was a wealthy man. As well as I remember him, all of them were wealthy, as far as that goes, from the standpoint of cattle and and. Uh, so forth, but um, what he did something outstanding. Uh, did he go? Or the I, I, I from from memory I just can't say, but it seems to me he had a long um, cattle uh, trail, and some of the uh, Roth men were in the drive. He he drove his cattle across up to Kansas and then caught the Chisholm Trail, you know. And uh, that's the way he took the market, their market from Gainesville. Did, you Did he live around Gainesville? I'm sorry? Yeah, I think so. And I, I, I'd rather think uh, that he was very wealthy, if, he, if I'm not mistaken, and had a, a beautiful, almost matching home. In Gainesville. Did your yeah. father talk about the Chisholm Trail? Yeah. No, he never used the Chisholm Trail. Mm -hmm. Now, he, when he come uh, from, um, by the time he moved to Pontotoc, the uh, railroad was uh, shipping uh, cattle to Kansas City, Chicago. He always took his to Chicago. And he, they were uh, by train. What about Judge Love? Did you know him? Who? Judge Love. Had oh, he was my father's best friend. Judge Love was a great man. <laughs> he was, and then all the Love family. Did you know the Rolfs were? No, I, I was quite young, you know, and I, I, I just know him. Just I know all these things through Joe Rolf, my father, and but the Love family, uh, some of the girls used to come to Rolfe and visit him when the senior love had died. And I remember they sent word to Pappy when he died. And um, so, uh, yes, the love, I guess every pioneer knows the love. They were, uh, well, uh, not only wealthy, they were just great pioneers, uh, builders. How or, or why did your father found the town of Roth? Well, he had made a kind of a scouting trip up here before. He was looking for grassland because the grass was getting short around Gainesville and all through the, the west there. Uh, why the grass was getting, and many of the cattlemen were kind of making moves, you know. And his wife had died. That was the grief that uh, his wife, uh, Anna, who was a very wonderful person, uh, died quite young. She was only 27 years old. And uh, she, she died two days after Christmas in 19 and... Uh, 19 and uh, 72, I think. I mean, 18 and 72. Uh -huh. And no, 
No. Uh, he left 18 and 82 because he left the, the hardly the next year he sold out. And uh, but he had scouted around in various things for land, and uh, so he, he decided uh, his wife was a Choctaw, so he decided to come to the uh, Choctaw Nation. And uh, I mean, he was in the Choctaw Nation. She was born in the Choctaw Nation, and that's including east of Ardmore and down in there. And uh, we're on the Chickasaw Nation, that's right. And so he decided he'd move to the Chickasaw Nation. And he, um, he left soon after she died. And, but this scouting trip, he said he found uh, grass knee high and plenty of water, you know, streams all around. And, and uh, he selected Rolf because it's a nice little stream. You know where that bridge is? Uh, did you go into Raw? Well, that's where he built his north, his log cabin. Just that's where we live, just up in there. You know the Larches? No, ma'am. Well, they they have that land they have now. They have a gorgeous home up there. And uh, but anyway, that's. Uh, I don't know what happened to the log house. Uh, I don't remember now. He, then he lived in Tishomingo, he'd between Tishomingo. Then um, after all that, 19 and um, four, three or four, he got the mining crazy. So uh, mining and uh, men who were come down from the north, you know, kind of shyster like men just after getting uh, something out of these people who wasn't used to them, you know, and interested him in a gold mine in Mena, Arkansas. So he fooled in that gold mine. He spent no end of money in that gold mine and moved us, we moved there. And uh, so that's the way his money went. And uh, then he called, found out that this, uh, these uh, nor Eastern or Northern people had uh, injected gold into those places, you know, for those men who were, I'd say, ignorant about it. And uh, so that nearly broke him. And then he moved back to Tishomingo. And uh, he, he had lots of trouble with one of his sons and that took money to get him out of the trouble. Uh, how did your father get people to settle in Roth after he founded the town site? Well, when he, uh, after he moved there, mm -hmm. well, they were people uh, who lived uh, a settlement about 25, and I expect it was near Winniewood, you know. This is talking about stretches of sections and sections, you know. So uh, they were people who lived there. And uh, so they, gradually they came. Then when he set up this ranch, he had uh, many cowboys and hired hands. And uh, so they began to come in. And he built us, he was the first merchant. He was the, had a kind of a mercantile store. And that was the first store in, that, that did in Rolfe. And it began to come there. And others began to come then, you know. And uh, then he was uh, the first postmaster. He had the postmaster in the same uh, store, the post office in the back. So he was the postmaster. And uh, he he was at uh, he helped to lay out the town, and um, so uh, then Suttis, who was married to my sister Betty Suttis, he was a very wealthy man. And he came there. He came from Leonard, Texas. Tom Suttis, 
You used to have his name up there on the store the last year. Somebody tore it down. And uh, he put in a big store. And then uh, I have pictures of all those men. And then Leon Can, who was a very wealthy Jew, he came in, you know, and all of those kind of men. And uh, Mr. Rodkey, who was a wealthy man from Paul's Valley, he came in and started, and he and others started up a bank in 1900. So that's the way it got started. And at one time, uh, it had a population, that was for Ada, it had a population of about 2,500. And uh, very thriving because there were cotton gins and cotton and lots of Negroes around. And uh, uh, my father donated the park that's there, and he donated the racetrack. Then they had races there. It was division headquarters for the races, and they had races. And uh, he, he also donated uh, 10 acres to the Negroes park for a park because they could not, you know, they couldn't associate with the in those days with the other in the parks. And there were a lot of Negroes, and my father always defended the, the Negroes because his father had slaves. And his, uh, uh, Charles, uh, Major Charles L. Roth was his father, and he was always a very wealthy man from Missouri. He was in mercantile business. And uh, so he, he just, uh, donated this and then he donated uh, right joining the racetrack this 10 acres to the Negro Park and then they had great races there it was a division headquarters and um, he lost his uh, he'd lose <laughs> he, uh, he was pretty bad to gamble like that but uh, he re he had a race horse he just crazy about him and uh, I know we kept him until he was an old horse, but uh, this race horse uh, would could outrun anything. But he would uh, fly the track. He'd leave before he get to the end. He would run off, and uh, so he ha he bet on the, his horse. Then he bet five hundred dollars. I have the uh, the suit, you know, where the man sued him. So the suit him. He lost his, lost that, and he just, uh, and uh, the, he lost the, um, this cotton gin that I tell you about on Pennington. Uh, they sued him, he went way back to the Indian rights, you know, something the title wasn't, was bad. So, but you know, he was a great man, he didn't take, in his old age, he just said, well, there were other things that took that place, you know, and he was well rewarded. Rewarded, his life had been so interesting. And would you tell me what chores you did around the ranch as a small girl? Well, we were all lazy. I rode horses. I'm just crazy about horses. I believe if you brought a horse up here to be all saddled and it's gentle enough, I I, I believe I get on that horse right now, and ride him right down through Main Street. <laughs> I just love a horse. So I was a, I was the active one of the family. See, I have two own sisters who are gone, and I'm the only female left. And, um, but I rode horses, and um, that was what I did for, and, and I always liked playing with boys, playing baseball, and um, I always liked school. I never had any trouble with me. I always liked to, uh, school. Sometimes we had to walk maybe two miles to school, but I didn't like mine that. It just, we were young and healthy, you know, and you, it was just part of life. We didn't uh, mind, and uh, we were happy fuss and quarrel like kids do, but uh, we always had plenty. And um, 
so as far as I remember before school, we just played all the time and um, just uh, went to, um, I started school when I was seven, I think, or when they were of age. Now, I think it was seven then. And we didn't have all those preliminary, you know, those kindergartens and all that stuff. And um, my first was at Rolf. Rolf had schools early. And uh, so I had my uh, part of my education at Tishmingo Murray College. At the early days of Murray College, when it had grade schools. I had my eighth grade there. When was Murray founded, Murray College? Why? When was Murray College founded? Well, that was in around 1912. 1912, it was, uh, it was, they had, I think they only had two years of college. And they had uh, grade school and high school connected with it. And they started out mainly, they, they were Indians, you know. And uh, it was very small. It wasn't the, the uh, grade schools, though, were separate from the oh, other others. Yep. And uh, there, I, I was interested in acting. They had lots of uh, uh, drama. Would you call it a subject? Drama. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they 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 presented especially to the grade school, and I was just uh, fascinated with it, and uh, so I, I I I was very active with this drama, and they'd always have me painted up a Negro, cause I started humorous, you know, <laughs> and uh, I always did real well, so it it was a a great place for. Uh, just kind of in between grade school and high school, you know. So it's still a great college. And Did you know uh, Bill Murray? Huh? Did you know Bill Murray? Oh, by my father, I did, I've eaten more chicken wings because of Royal Murray than any man alive. Tell me, tell me about it. Well, my father was crazy about Bill Murray. He was a Democrat. And, uh, oh, nothing but a Democrat. And when we were girls, he, he never found a, a man that was good enough for his girls. He was real bad, hard on us like that. He was real, he, he, he real strict about it. He, he, he just didn't want you with a man at all. And uh, we had troubles. And, of course, I always, always liked them. Still do. And... Uh, I, I, I would just slip off, he'd make me kind of bad. And I'd slip off and go with him and he'd say, uh, who'd you go, who, who was that boy you was with last night? And I said, he's Mr. So-and-so's girl. He says, oh, I know him. He's one of those red faced Republicans. He says, I, I saw a Republican, he says, I'd say he'd be in the penitentiary, he's always saying that. He'll be in the penitentiary time, he's 20 years old. Rich, got nothing, he's just rich, and he, he won't be worth a snap. You just don't you come here with another Republican. Well, I'd st 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 come with a Republican, because as a rule, they were wealthy more, you know, they really would come down and, and interested in education. And uh, around Reagan, you find pretty serious, uh, pretty seedy folks, you know, uh, dates, poor Joe's turkey. And I was after those uh, wealthy ones. I didn't get to know anything about them. But anyway, he, he would bring Bill, Bill Murray. And the first time Bill Murray had a, bought a, had a car, he used to come through the town riding a mule with cuckleberries all over it. And so then he bought a car. So he, he got word to Joe that he's coming out and taking him riding in his car. And uh, so he came and he said his family could go. That's the first time I ever rode in a car. And it was a car 
with straps, you know, down, and you could let the top down. So he had the top down, and he came with a long linen uh, coat on. He was uh, dressed, you know, in a business dress, with this long linen coat and this car, and he had a chauffeur. He wasn't, I guess he didn't know how to drive, but he had a chauffeur, and he piled all of us in that car and took us for a ride. And, uh, oh boy, we, some of us scared, and my brother Clem was scared, and he cried, and, and uh, when Pappy got, when we got home then, my mother didn't go, she stayed to cook, you know, that's all she did in her life was cook that for dinner. He was gonna have dinner with us. So we had dinner, and. And of course we had a big platter of fried chicken, and you, 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 in those days you just had everything laid and fried, maybe fried ham, maybe cooked ham and chicken, and everything. but he went for chicken, and uh, so they made us, made the children wait. We had to wait till all of this, uh, Bill Murray and I don't know some else with him, but anyway, all these men got to eating. Mother wouldn't even let us come in there. And that's another thing we were hampered in our personalities back in those days, you know. We were to be uh, listened, not be heard. We, we just keep cold and don't be a... And so, so one day uh, they, they said Bill Murray was going to have dinner with us when he was running, you know, for election for certain things. Bill Murray. And I said, well, I'm getting sick of eating wings from Bill Murray. And uh, I don't know, and, and uh, oh, my father wouldn't like that at all, because I'm very outspoken. And uh, so time went on, and then when he was elected that time, uh, my father, I'll tell you, he went through that uh, Johnson County election for Bill Murray. He had to have him go uh, governor. He just had to have him governor. And of course, Bill Murray did get to be governor in a big way. And um, so, Pappy then was getting up in age, I think he was in his late 70s or 80s. And I like politics, I'm like just crazy about politics, used to be, I don't get to play. I play a little bit, of, uh, I listen on the TV, I mean, I'm interested. And um, so it took him up to see Bill Murray. And when he's way down the line, in the line, you know, and he was getting kind of suffocated, you know. It, it seemed to me then we went through the basement some way to the place where the inaugural ceremony was going on. I don't know just how we got there, but we're all in line, thousands of people. And my father was just about suffocated, and Bill Murray was sitting up there and standing up there. And that old bird could see Joe Rolfe way back there in the back. And so uh, one of the, uh, he must have, uh, one of his aides, I guess, come back there and got him, brought him up to the front. Now that's the kind of man he was with his friends. And I don't think he ever let his friends down. I don't believe he ever did. He's, he brought him up to the front because he knew how that was hard on him back there. And so then later on, during the Depression, I was left, I was divorced in 1928 from my husband. And um, so the, the Depression came on. And uh, I uh, just uh, had a very hard time. You'd have to work for about $25 a month, 25 or $50 a month if you got work then. And so there was an um, opening for a professional registered nurse. They'd always used a practical nurse at the school for the deaf. And there was an opening. And usually during the Depression, a state institution, I've worked for them all, all my life, near, I mean adult life, and you'll find that you're better off in an institution where it's a, an essential institution then you are scouting around. And um, 
you, you can pretty well be assured of some kind of salary. And so uh, this position was open. So there were several uh, professional nurses I had uh, applied for, and I knew it. So uh, I uh, told Pappy, I said, he, Governor Murr was elect then, he hadn't taken to office, and he lived at Tishomingo at the Payne Hotel. And um, so I said, Pappy, write to Bill Murr and see if he won't give me a job. I said, he owes me one for all the chicken wings I've eaten. <laughs> and he said, well, I guess that'd be all right. So he wrote it. And you know, he just wrote right back, and he said, send your daughter down here. So I did. Now I got in the car early one morning. I got off at 6 o'clock. I thought, well, I'm going to get down there early. So I drove down, and I went in and, oh, two words, too cute for words. And I was scared to death because I know how abrupt he was, you know. And I'm just scared to death. And um, so he uh, he said, uh, I, I went right up here, came down, and they came down. These businessmen, you could tell them, prominent-looking men, were all sitting around, you know. And uh, when I got there, and uh, here come an aide. I hadn't been there ten minutes. An aide first came down and asked my name. I told him I was Mildred Roth Smith and uh, the daughter of Joe Roth. I wanted him to recognize that. And uh, so in ten minutes, here he come. He, he said, Miss Roth, they call me Miss Roth. He said, Miss Roth, you can come with me. And he took me up, and all these men were sitting around, and so, um, and I got there, and I was just trembling. And uh, he said, "Now, what do you want, <laughs> brother?" He, and that just scarily scared me. And I said, "Well, Governor, I'm been un uh, I'm uh, unemployed, and uh, there is a position uh, open at the school for the deaf that pays better than most." Uh, places, and I, I have to be near my children at Roth, and that's the only thing that uh, I find that, that would suit my needs. And, um, and I said, it's open, and there are several other applicants now for the job. And uh, he says, all right, go home, tell your pappy that uh, I'll write to him. Now that's all he said to me. And he says, tell Joe hello. Oh boy. And so, so when I got downstairs, one of these fellows said, say, just what you got, how'd you get up there? We've been waiting here since six o'clock. I said, well, pays to know somebody. And so I did tell him, I was nice enough to tell him that my father was a Jim Bill Murray's lifelong friend. But uh, I just loved that old man. I really did. Did you get the job? Yes, sir, I got that job. He wrote him back in about two days. Yeah, I got that job and stayed seven years over there, all doing that difficult depression. You know, when the banks closed, why people didn't have a dime. And uh, in the th uh, was it 29 or 30? I was there in 29 and 30. I think it's 1930. All of, I had my check. I, I hadn't cashed it. So uh, here word came that all the banks were closed. You couldn't get a dime. No one could get a cent. Don't make a difference how much money you had. And my the doctor, chief of the clinic, Dr. Anadam, couldn't get a dime. And I said, well, I have my check. And he said, well, you can't cash it. I said, well, I might be able to. So I knew a friend, and uh, we'll call him John Doe, and I called him, and uh, I told him that uh, I didn't have any money, and I had that check. And, uh, and he said, well, I can help you out. So uh, 
he helped me out and cashed my check. And so Dr. Anadown came and he said, I can't get a cent and my father died. And uh, he says, I, he lived in Kansas and he said, I can't go to his funeral. He said, I just have to go if I have to walk and hitchhike. And I said, well, doctor, I'll let you have the money to go. I've got money. And uh, I said, I got my check cash. He said, how on earth did you get that? I said, I just knew somebody. So all my life, I mean, you know, he's just always been a, uh, some way to get, you know, get along. And um, so I, I, I didn't see depression hard at all because I had a good salary. Yeah. And we didn't feel it at home. We didn't, we never were used to living high, you know. My mother was a great provider in the, her own canon, her own, you Let know. Let me ask, did you know Buck Garrett? Buck Garrett at... Uh, Ardmore. At Ardmore, yes. I don't know him, you know, like personally, but I know him as a... Uh, is he a senator? No, he was a federal marshal or U.S. marshal or... He was one? He was a marshal or a sheriff. Oh, yeah, yeah, he's a sheriff. Yeah. Look, Gary. I think my uh, brother Andy knew him. He was the one that's kind of a troublesome, but raw. Yeah, but Gary, I've heard him talk, you know. I didn't know him personally, though. He was rather, uh, well, well, sometimes we call it popular, but he was awfully well known, wasn't he? That's what I understand. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't know him of any consequence. Now, your grandfather was Joseph Roth also? No, he was Charles L., Major Charles L. Roth. Now, tell me about when he settled a thousand acres in Texas. Well, he came from uh, uh, Saint Joe, around St. Joe in Missouri. I won't say which one he come because I'm forgetting. But uh, after his, uh, he, he th was very thrifty in the, in the mercantile business. And uh, he decided to increase it, you know, make it bigger and you have more to sell. So he had a big, enormous building, expensive building, had it um, built. And uh, when he, um, after he got it, uh, got through with it, it, they condemned it. It had some, uh, something wrong, cracks or something that they, inspectors or someone, I don't know who, in, uh, condemned it for a store, and uh, so he he sold out. He, they, they were easily discouraged, and he sold out, and his, uh, now my father's mother died. That's the major's uh, first wife, my father. There were five of those boys, and he, uh, grandfather, they came from Missouri in covered wagons. They had two covered wagons. And, but he married within a year after my father's mother died and leaving these five little children. And they were uh, two boys, three boys and two girls. So he, he moved to, uh, I don't know how come he, he settled in Cook County. I don't recall why he chose, but a lot of the people were choosing Cook County because it was a cattle country. And uh, so he decided to uh, homestead, come there and homestead. And uh, that's what he did near Callisburg, Texas. And uh, then the Civil War came on. 
in 61 and uh, he was a uh, major in the Civil War. And in the, in the his... Confederacy? Huh? In the Confederacy? Yeah. During... Um, oh, he, he had uh, the frontier, you know. Uh, Any stories about him? What, what did he do during the war? Uh, I think they patrolled some of the borders of uh, Arkansas and uh, or maybe Indian Territory and uh, down into Cook County. I think they were patrolling these Northerners. Oh, they hated Northerners. And he had he he had slaves then, and he was a very very great man for our community, you know, and highly respected man. And uh, this second wife is the, um, he had uh, two or three children for her. And, uh, they, but they, uh, but she, my father was only 12 years old when they came from Missouri to to Cook County. Did he talk about the trip to Texas, your father? Did he talk Did about Did your father what? tell you about the trip to Texas? Oh, yes. He, it was a very hard trip because this um, uh, was second wife. The boys, uh, they didn't get along with her. They didn't like her. She was a strict Kentuckian, you know, and very just uh, entirely different to their mother and um, required so much of them that uh, they had a very difficult trip along, but no tragedies, no tragedies. And they came around through, um, oh, out of Kansas and then caught whatever trail was over here. Uh, the Texas, Texas Road? Yeah, kind of like the Texas Road. And um, so, they settled in here, and I think there was a house on this place that they homesteaded. And uh, then they they farmed, and he raised hogs, and uh, he was very thrifty like that. And um, then, of course, he got in the he was in the uh, Civil War four years. Then while he was in the Civil War, why they had to my father and my Uncle John Rolfe, who was very prominent in Rolfe, very prominent cattleman, by, they were awfully young. And she, she was so nice and nice clean, you know. And she would do coldest of winter. She'd make them sit out on the steps and pull off their shoes and wash their feet before they come in. And my father disliked her tremendously all of his life. He'd sit and tell that. And uh, Uncle John didn't like it. None of the boys liked him, liked her. She wasn't kind to him at all. And um, this uh, Andy, he's my character, Andy Raw. I always usually keep his picture up. I have all kind of awards, but they don't let you put them up on the wall, and uh, but this uh, Andy Roth, that's uh, my father's brother. He was older, Andy and uh, and uh, Jane, Jim, Andy and Jim. They were uh, they were, were both younger. They were both older than my father, and uh, they had a, quite a bit of education, as much as a major could give them. And they went to school at around Whitesboro somewhere where they had kind of a, oh, I don't know if it was a college or not, but anyway, they got some education. And my father had education. He was had the first newspaper in Raw, and he was a good newspaper man. And um, so this uh, Will and Andy were killed by the Lee gang. 
notorious. Yeah, yeah, tell me about that. Oh, that that's a that's a terrible that's a hair rising story. Is that for cattle rustlers? That is the, for cattle rushers. Okay. And uh, Jim, you see, they, these men have intuition, you know, about the cattle. They can almost smell a, a outlaw or, or something goes wrong with those cattle. And they'd been on all these cattle, cattle drives. And so uh, Jim would sus suspected these uh, lead gang. They were just roaming the country, shooting up and killing. and. Uh, so uh, there was a posse formed by the uh, oh the one of this prominent sheriff sheriff uh, see I can't remember him either he's he's a his he's in that history book but uh, he's awfully anyway he formed the posse to get these uh, li this league gang so they always come to Andy my uncle Andy my father's older brother and he told because to head the posse because he was smart about the outlaws you know knew their hideouts and so the sheriffs and all would come to Andy to get him so they came and they lived in this house right in the skirts of Ardmore is part of Ardmore now and they have a replica of that house, Uncle Alvey's house, on the uh, park the city has erected that Al first Alvey Roth. But anyway, Alvey Roth was a very wealthy Roth in Ardmore. And, uh, but th this posse came, and so Andy told them he lived there in this, uh, my Alvy Ross, they all lived together, all these men lived together. And uh, Alvy told him, he said, now, Sheriff, I, this isn't the day to go. He said, if I told him, he says, because they know we're after them. They get word around through the community, and they know we're on there, we're, we're after them. And he said, they, the outlaws had a house down on a little creek there, about three miles uh, southeast of Ardmore. And these houses, this house was built with portholes, you know. Uh, all they do is stick their guns out. And he says, these men will be prepared when you go. And uh, so uh, they, the sheriff said, oh no, I'm going today, here today. We've got to go today. You've got to go today. And he just kind of put the bee on him, you know, to, that he had to go. So he led the posse. He knew all of the different places. He knew where these outlaws were. And he and um, Jim and a fellow by the name of uh, Dick somebody, Dixon, anyway, the three of them led the posse, and they was it Heck Thomas? Heck Thomas, that is a sheriff. That's one. Yeah, yeah, that's it, Heck Thomas. But he was in the back. Uh, the Rolfs were leading this posse, and as they got just across the creek, while those uh, Lees, two or three guns started pouring it on them, killed them every one. And they just kept a shooting on Andy. And uh, they said he finally crawled to the uh, tree and just lay down and died. And uh, Jim, they killed him, it seems, the first thing. He and this uh, Nix. But this uh, sheriff didn't, he didn't get across the creek. He didn't cross the creek. They started shooting before they already got across, and they turned back. They didn't go, so he just got them killed. And uh, so then uh, my father and Alvey put up big reward for the lead gang, they and that Heck Thomas is the one that uh, got them. He just scouted that whole countryside, you know. And he'd follow him, and uh, he'd get, they'd tip him off. 
So one time they tipped him off that they were um, camped down a mountain there, not too out from uh, Ardmore somewhere, way down in those areas. And they were camped down, way down in the valley. And uh, so they, um, Heck Thomas and his uh, men, climbed this hill and could peep over and see them in this camp. So uh, they just uh, went, uh, threw their guns on them and they were unarmed, you know. They had taken off their guns for the night. And it was uh, early in the morning before the sun came up, just barely could see. And they, they, pep, they, 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 they held all those guns. He must have had a large posse, I don't know. But anyway, they just held those guns on them and went down and captured them. So that's how they were captured. And uh, uh, somebody got the reward, I don't know, but uh, uh, I, I met the Later on, I was in uh, down to Walnut Bend, Texas. That's where these people of my Roth families are all buried, at Walnut Bend, Texas, Hibbett Cemetery. So I was down there, and I met um, Mr. Uh, Merle, who lives in Gainesville, a very prominent man. And he, he, this man uh, that I'm telling you about uh, worked for Mr. Merle. He owned the property around Walden Bend. Mr. Merle did. And he, he, he told me that uh, his father took the covered wagon, the wagon, and uh, drove down to where they were, where the three men were lying dead, took them there and put a big uh, car thing over the wagon, you know, and, and just laid all the men in it in the back of the wagon and dr drove them to Gainesville. And uh, oh, he said it was a gruesome thing. Flies and everything, you know, and uh, following the wagon. And they took them to Gainesville for burial. And that's where they were buried. Now. What about the Indian raid? Oh, those Indian raids are awful. They just, uh, they didn't kill any of the, the Rolfs, but my um, father was only 12 years old when he, you know, when the worst ones come. And uh, one attack was on their neighbor. And, and uh, the um, Indians came and just cut those two, the two or three of the, the neighbors, just cut them open. And some of them, they speared them with shot to, into the lungs, you know. And they were great marksmen. And but this one family, one, they just cut their abdomen wide open, and, and then shot another one with the bow and arrow that they used. And uh, so he was alive, but the other one was dead. And so the neighbor come over to, for my father. He had to be a man. He was a man at 12, and these Indians, this, the, the one that with the bow and arrow, this um, end, you know, what do you call it? The arrowhead? Yeah, the arrowhead left in his lungs. So they wanted to take him into Gainesville to a doctor, which was about 12 or 15 miles. So my father uh, hitched up the wagon and all, and uh, they put him in the back of the wagon and drove him to Gainesville. And the doctor was not a surgeon. He was not a surgeon. So he couldn't remove that arrowhead. And he died. And uh, my, but then that left them orphans. They had, he, he had children. So it left his widow and, and these children. Then they wanted, the, she wanted to go to Sherman because her relatives lived at Sherman. So 
it was in late in Dece December, cold and all. What year? Oh, in, um, I'd say that was, uh, and he was only 12 years old. He was born in 18 and uh, 84. I, I guess that was about 18 and, uh, well, his father, my grandfather was in the uh, uh, Civil War, so it must have been around in 1862 or something okay. like that. And um, so they took they took them to Gaines, to Sherman, and uh, the trip, they nearly froze. And uh, Pappy always said that he's always a doing this, you know, and, and he said, that's the to toll that froze going from Gainesville to uh, Sherman. That, uh, uh, this norther came up. But anyway, uh, Grandfather Rolf, that's uh, the Major Charles, he took the, to the girl, they had a girl and a, and a son, and he, they took the girl and raised her. The mother died. She grieved herself to death. And they took the girl and raised her until she was grown. So that's the kind of people that were back in those days. What about the 700 Ranch? Oh, that's uh, the, that's Uncle Alvis Ranch. There were all those brothers on that ranch. Why? Why were they called the 700? Uh, let's see. They had 700 horses, and I don't know how many mules, but it was named after the, the number of animals they had. And uh, now Uncle Alvey was a flashy man. He was a very flashy man. He had two wives, and uh, he had plenty of money. And he liked to spend it, and he liked to drink. And he was just a oh, he was just a wonderful man. Children would love a man like that, you know. I I, I didn't. Uh, uh, I was uh, about twelve or oh, I don't know, fourteen years old when he died, and uh, he. Uh, had high, uh, this is a little bit cute, I think, of him, a story. He uh, lived in a little, he had two places, one at Woolford and a ranch at Woolford, and then this one not far from Ardmore, south of Ardmore. But he, at Woolford, he hired a, 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 a man for the, uh, on the ranch, and he hired her for a cook. And this was just a two-room house, a kitchen. And, um, and a bedroom. And so uh, they, they got married. They, it was their first day married. And they, uh, when she got there, the, the cook told me this story. And when they got there, why, to go to work, she said, well, where's our room, Mr. Ron, where are we going to sleep? And he said, oh, right in there, sleep in there where I do. So he usually had a bottle of whiskey under his pillow and a shot and a, and a pistol. Uh, and uh, he said, by right in there. And she said, that's where we had to sp spend their honeymoon. And oh, he was a character. And uh, he drove fine horses. And he just, ooh, he just made them just fly. And um, he had drive from, um, Ardmore to uh, around uh, Gettysburg or uh, wherever that place, Gainesville, near Gainesville, in uh, maybe two or three hours. And uh, uh, so, he, that, so one day he was going to buy a new ranch in Texas. So. He started out in the buggy. He, he had two, you know. He always drove two. And um, he was on his way to Texas. And a wagon full of cotton. 
was coming by. And uh, so he could, I mean, they said he must have seen the wagon, but it was too late. He jerked the horses and turned them, and one horse jumped on a, and hit a tree and turned the buggy. That turned the whole buggy over. The horse fell and the whole thing fell over and broke his neck. And he, of course, he died there on the scene. And uh, so they always have had a memorial for him because Ardmore admired him. He was very generous, you know, and all charities and things like that. And uh, so the city then, uh, very late afterwards, after this old cabin had just worn out, why uh, they tried to make the uh, the same cabin rebuild it. It looks a lot like it, but not like the the picture in that book. Uh, tell me about the time your father drove the 2,500 head of cattle from Texas up here. Well, he had uh, uh, two covered wagons. He had a chuck wagon and uh, he had a wagon for sleeps, you know, and things like that. And uh, he had two Negro cooks. He always had a Negro cook. And he, he kept that one nigger for years after after we moved to Rolf. Oh, he loved that nigger. And we called them niggers then. You don't do that now, you call them blacks. But we have always loved uh, niggers. I mean, the, the, those we have associated with as cooks and things like that, the old-timey niggers, they were awfully good and loyal. And, uh, so he had, and he had, um, let's see, how many cowboys? He had about eight or ten cowboys, you know, to keep these cattle in line. And uh, What does each man's job on the cattle drive? What does each man do? Here's one. What does each man do on the cattle drive? Well, they, they keep the, the, the cattle, they, there's two or so many on one side and so many on another, you know, and someone and a leader. And they've always got a, a leading bull, a bull that uh, he, he, he gives all the directions to those ca cattle. And uh, they have that before they start out. And then there's a cowboy here and a cowboy here and a cowboy in the back. And um, they... Uh, they're just organized, and the cattle occasionally, as Pappy said, occasionally something will scare them. If something scares one up there in the front, if, or if that bull gets scared, they just uh, they just panic, and they just mill around and around, and some of them will run off and do this, and so they had a, a, a small one on this trip. And, well, these cowboys will get to go and get these cattle and get them back in line again. If there's a stampede, how do you stop a stampede? Yeah, well, you that's what I say. These cowboys all go to the outskirts, you know, in the direction they're running. And they they, they just keep a, a working with them. And, and they work with this bull. He's, he's a master. You work with this bull. And maybe if there's one up front, see, just watching the bull. And they just, sometimes they'll just swarm around and around. But sometimes they'll scatter. They just scatter. But uh, they, most of the time, if you keep them fed, he says, and you keep them watered, you can't let them get thirsty and all, or, or, or hunger. So you have to stop and. At night, they stop and bed them down. And then when they begin to get restless to get up, well, then they get up and get on the trail again. How many miles could they make in one day? Well, I'd, uh, I don't know. I, I'd guess about it. He was, um, 
he was three weeks, three or four weeks from uh, from uh, Randolph, Gainesville, to uh, Pontiac County, and uh, I'd say five or ten miles. How? What kind of food they have in the cattle tribe? Well, potatoes. Oh, they like potatoes. Potatoes, coffee, and flour. They'd make these um, baking powder biscuits. They'd make biscuits. This nigga cook would cook. They'd always be a good cook. And they'd have beans. And um, they none of them, none of the Ross eat many vegetables. I mean these older Ross, senior Ross. My father ate very few vegetables. And he wouldn't eat uh, chicken, very no beef. He said he wanted to eat all that's cannibals. So uh, they have bacon. They, and Uncle um, Alvey wouldn't have, he ate nothing but steak, bacon, and potatoes. And he was a, kind of a short man with a very big belly. And uh, he walked real fast. And uh, my father wasn't a big eater. He never, he stayed the same weight all of his life. He was 90 years old, he's the same weight, 180. But he ate the same weight. And the same thing. He ate three fried eggs every day, as far as I know, 40 years. Three fried eggs. He wouldn't eat meat. He might eat a little liver from a chicken. And uh, I say, you talk about cholesterol, you know, and eggs. He had no such thing because he was healthy for 90, 92 years. So, but he, you, 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 he, you couldn't get him to do that that day. In the morning, he'd eat a fried egg, four biscuits, a bowl of cereal, and a cup of coffee. And the morning he died, he got up and ate that same menu. And uh, he started, he always go uptown shave every day, walk up to Rolf from, uh, from his house there in Rolf. And he'd walk up there every morning at the same time. And so he started up there and he'd turn around and come back. And he came, always would come through the kitchen door, and then go through the dining room into the front room. It was a day bed. He'd go in there and lie down. So this day he went the, the 13th of July or sometime in 1940. He walked in there and lay down on that um, bed and uh, died. We, my mother went in there to call him for lunch and he was dead. Wasn't that a nice way to go? Yes. It certainly was. Um, what year did you graduate from high school? Well, 19, I, I, 1914, I had, uh, I missed the, uh, uh, the graduating exercise year. And uh, so then I, I uh, made up for it through the uh, board, uh, the local school board and the superintendent and the county superintendent. And he gave me, a, the county superintendent gave me the equivalent of, a, I, of this grade, 12th grade. And that was 19 and 14. And the county school superintendent here. Now you took your nurse's training at St. Vincent Sanitarium? Huh? Why did you want to become a nurse? I really didn't want to. I, my father was a spiritualist, and he wanted me to be good. He wanted to send me to a spiritual school. That, I mean, that taught spiritualism, you know, in Baltimore, Maryland. And he was a great reader. He had one of the biggest libraries in the uh, Indian Territory there in the early days, you know. And uh, so he wanted me to, to go. Well, I've always been a, a kind of a 
inclined to be figure out things before they happen see things before they happen I've, I've, I've had that I must have kind of got it from him he he used it a lot he educated us a lot and no one was interested in it except me and the family my mother didn't pay much attention to it but I love that uh, uh, psychic stuff and um, so my sisters these two are very devout Catholics these two half sisters they went to the convent and um, it, it Sherman too all of those Ross went to the convent and uh, Uncle Alvis two daughters went to the convent and uh, so uh, I don't know. I, I I didn't be exactly what uh, I wanted in life. I didn't seem to want to be a nurse, but yet I was always the type for to to be a nurse. I just had the qualities. Uh, I had endurance, which is the greatest commodity I know you can uh, have, and uh, through life. If you don't have it, you, you have a double, an awful hard time. What did you want to do if you didn't want to be a nurse? Well, I think I wanted to, um, I wanted to uh, be where I could show myself or something, where I could portray somebody. I've always been interested in kings and queens and royalty. And, uh, and uh, uh, I seem to be wanting to be kind of flashy, but I... I Something always hindered me, and I think it was the uh, economics. I just always been so I couldn't have what I actually wanted, and uh, I always wanted. Maybe I wanted to be uh, on a big nightclub. I'm crazy, as crazy about the nightclubs, crazy about dancing, crazy about glitter and lights. And I was the only one in the family with that kind of flair, you know. And uh, if I couldn't get it on a real high scale, I, 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 I did on a, uh, a little lower. And that's the reason I was uh, stayed so, I mean, I was so devoted to the American Legion. I could do so much work through the American Legion. All these benefits, I just hatch up a benefit for you to say anything. And I love to get there and uh, make it glamorous. And I've just been that kind. And uh, but in nursing, I I, I I seem very devoted. I'm very did, devoted. Did your father say that you should become a nurse? No, he didn't want me to be a nurse. He didn't want me to be a nurse. He said, "Now you'll have to be in there bathing men." He said, "Why, I, you can't do that." And I said, well, they'll teach you how. No, he says, you'll be there and you'll have to help them go to the bathroom. He was thinking all of that side of it, see. He just didn't want me in it. He didn't want me at all. He never did want me. He never gave in. And, um, but I think it's uh, probably a great thing that I did because I had a, uh, very interesting and very many opportunities that I was uh, had the initiative to take, and uh, I met many great people in the First World War. Why I got to meet Franklin Delano Roosevelt when he was Secretary of Navy. I thought he's the most handsome thing I ever saw. I danced on the floor in, in Pensacola with uh, Wally Warfield Simpson, the, the, who married the king. Her husband was a lieutenant in Pensacola. And uh, it's just all those things that it, it helps you when you get 90 years old. You can uh, think about it. So why exactly did you become a nurse then? If, huh? Why exactly did you become a nurse? What? I think a necessity. 
but we were very poor, you know, by that time. My father didn't have anything, sold everything he had. I think that uh, our connection with the Catholic religion, you know, and the convent, the convent was in Sherman, and uh, we were all uh, comfortable with that, and that's all the girls. That, it's only the girls that uh, uh, associated with the Catholic Church. Now, you attended St. Vincent Sanitarium yes. in Sherman? Yes. It was uh, 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 governed by the Sisters of Charity, who are the greatest teachers of nursing in the world. They, they don't only teach in um, nursing care, but they give you a foundation of religion. And that's where I got my religion. And uh, and I uh, for the poor, I'm very uh, uh, just very conscientious about poor um. uh, and uh, the needy, rather than the lofty and things. I think they can buy it, and I've always been very considerate. And my nursing has been more or less with the handicapped people. Tell me about your nurses' training. Well, it was hard for me because um, I'd never been away from home in my life, from raw. And uh, I always loved home, just loved my home. And we all did. We just loved home. We just so devoted to it. And uh, that was uh, kind of handicapped for a long time. I just couldn't get weaned away from home. Uh, I was more shy than you'd think I am because of this strict training, more or less from my father than anyone. My mother had always said, he said, I don't want to go to that nurse training. And, and she said, well, she wants to go because she wants to have some type of work. And she's growing, she has to have something. And uh, she wants to make herself a lot of living. And she said, he said, well, I don't want to go there. And she said, well, it's better to have a half a loaf of bread than none. And so she said, she's going. So my mother stood up for me, you know. And my mother could see. My mother was, a, was not an educated woman, but she's highly intelligent. So you don't always have to have a college degree if you have enough intelligence. What type of classes did you have? Classes? Yes. Well, we, we had medicine, which we call Materia Medica, and we had obstetrics, which is uh, with the childbearing area, and we had, uh, we didn't have psychology. We had physiology, we had anatomy, we had, uh, now you see, we got very little science in our days. And, um, we had, um, of course, we had, uh, then we had the practical the side, bedside, and where that's you, where they give you your dedication. Where would you have the bedside, the, the practical? Well, the bedside, the sick, you comforted them. I mean, was this in Sherman? Or yes, in Sherman. All my training was in Sherman. And was this at the... Was this at St. Vincent's? It's all at St. Vincent. Yeah, it's no longer St. Vincent. It belongs to the city, I think. City Hospital, I think. I don't know what it is. Tell me about some experiences. Now, there's a class back there. I, I see Did that. you see that? Yeah. Tell me about some experiences in your nurse's training that you recall. Well, back in those days, entirely different to what it is now. In your first six weeks, you call it your probation period. You don't get a cap or anything, but you stay on first floor, which is we call a basement, but it isn't. It's first floor, and on this first floor are more or less charity people and colored people, and there the the, the sisters of charity didn't uh, they they didn't uh, separate and say. You take care of, they'd say, you, you take care of this black, they call them Negroes. You take care of this Negro as same as you do that white person. I don't, they didn't allow you to have complaints, you know, on race. Uh, they didn't have it. 
And I've always, with colored nurses, I've always been unusually kind to them. I, if we'd have a banquet and a registered nurse would attend the, this, the meeting, and they say, no, we can't have her, they won't allow her. Well, I'd sneak her into that banquet some way. The nurses didn't object, but the uh, system objected. And for a long time, it hadn't been long since they wouldn't let uh, the Negro, you know, eat at the banquet with the white. But I, I, but it's my training. And I've had some of the finest friends I have are black nurses. They're just wonderful nurses. And so we, we would uh, take care of these black patients. That would be those uh, probation days. Then when the pro pro probation days are over, and you get a calf. And brother, you think you're something when you get on a calf and they get up on first floor and uh, then you begin to take orders. So I was scared to death of doctors. I never used to doctors. My parents never had doctors. They never went to hospital in their lives, and and they, they died in their own bed. And uh, so I just never was. Uh, I just kind of scared of doctors. I thought I'd never get used to them. But the sisters had you almost rarer than them. You'd have to rise the minute a doctor come, if you were sitting at the desk. You rose. You got up and stood like you was a soldier before a general. And uh, you should nurse and just treat them about any way they want to now. So uh, uh, you get you go through that. And I, I, I tell this story because I, through my ignorance, you know, of nursing. So I was supposed to get a urine specimen from a man. Well, that's pretty tough for me to do anyway, you know. I was awful shy about that. That was my first time. I had to go through all the procedures, you know, go down to the laboratory and get the sterile bottle, bring it back and talk to the man, you know, and tell him to try to get this specimen for it. It's very difficult. He couldn't get the specimen for it. So I would do... Uh, trinkle the water, do all of those little things, you know, to, so his kidneys would act. So I'd come back in and, and I'd say, uh, uh, have your kidneys acted? No. I says, I just came. Oh, I said, please do. I said, you know, that doctor's just going to, I don't know what he's going to do to me if I don't get a specimen. Oh, please try to get one. So uh, and next time I went back, went back three or four times. You, you didn't stay in the room, you know, where he's trying. Oh, that was bad. And so you, so the third time or fourth, I went back and I said, did you uh, get a specimen? He said, well, uh, one of them acted. Oh, I said, it did. One of your kidneys? Yeah, one of my kidneys acted. So I went on, got this uh, urine. And I took it out to the office, you know. Uh, uh, I mean, I took it to the laboratory. So here come Dr. Gunby. He was big shop, the chief of staff. And oh boy, we did jump up for him. So he said, did uh, Miss Rob, did you get a specimen? And uh, I said, oh yes. And he said, and his kidneys acted. And I said, well, one of them did. Oh, he made out a roar. He said, which one? I said, I don't know. He didn't tell me. He didn't tell me which kidney acted. And so uh, he laughed and he laughed and he roared. And the tears were just rolling down my cheek. It just nearly killed me. Because I thought he was making fun of me, see. Instead of being humorous and laughing too, I was just too ignorant about it. I thought that you know it. I don't know all of all. And uh, so uh, when uh, sister, I went run back then. I, as soon as he left, well, I left and run run the linen closet and cried. And sister come back there and she said, "Oh, 
they know how to get you, you know. Oh, she said, hey, you got to get over that. And he said, that wasn't too bad, and you, you could have just let the doctor enjoy it. And uh, she said, that wasn't too bad, that wasn't bad, you were just timid. And I said, well, I, I just thought he was making fun of me. She said, no, now you don't do like that. Nurses don't do like that. You've got to learn better to control yourself. So they were great teachers that way. But uh, uh, it was, um, they made life very comfortable for you in training. They, but they were strict. They didn't allow you to go out. Curfew was 9 o'clock. you got to be in bed by 10. And uh, you got to get up at 5. You got to go to mass. They have mass in the in the sanitary. Well, you have got to go to mass. And the Protestants don't have to, but those that are uh, Catholics do. You bet they've got to. And uh, you you don't have, uh, but you make lots of friends, you know. And, uh, so I love the sisters. Oh, I love those sisters. Tell me about your commencement exercises. Oh, I tell you. I was a valedictorian of the class, and I was to say a speech. And uh, Sister wrote the speech, Sister Savina. Uh, Dr. McElhan always said she was the biggest liar he ever saw. <laughs> he hated her. And so, but she's smart. She's real bright. And she must have had a good education. So she wrote my speech. And, of course, it went like this. The doctors and nurses are, uh, are uh, getting prepared for the war. You know, we're preparing for the war of 1917. And it says, are uh, getting in preparedness. That was the subject of my speech, was preparedness. And uh, so, I'd had some uh, public speaking in school. We call it uh, uh, elocution or something like that, you know. I'd had that in high school. And uh, so, uh, I, I, but they, they did allow me to read it. And uh, I, I still have it. It's, it's just a one. The Navy, Army and Navy are putting themselves into preparedness by tending to their medical profession and uh, things like that. It was just a wonderful, it was just wonderful. She wrote it, I didn't write it. But I have kept it through the years. And um, after then, they gave us a big uh, party. And uh, Dr. McElhannon was uh, one of the doctors, and he was a handsome thing. And uh, I, 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 I always had my eye on him, but I was too shy to ever act, uh, you know. I, I was really shy. And uh, so later on, when I got to know him better, he said, you know, I always tried to flirt with you, and I, I've never seen anyone that was so hard to get their attention. And I said, well, I'm just shy. I just afraid of you or something. I don't know what, but uh, uh, student uh, doctors will take that out of you, brother. Those interns, you know. Oh, there's something. So but what, I sure have met some nice ones. What's the first thing you did after graduation? I had the most interesting thing that I did. The first thing I did when I finished. It was the beginning of the war. The war, war I believe had been declared. Yes, war had been declared. And the American Red Cross in Sherman, Texas was, um, they enrolled nurses for this military. Nurses were not under a military status, professional registered nurses. And I had finished this, just finished training. You know, I hadn't had worked anywhere. So uh, this Red Cross was asking for volunteers to come to Camp Louis, Fort Worth, to take care of the black people. And uh, 
we called them niggers. And uh, so the whites, they didn't let them uh, in the white barracks, you know. They built separate barracks for them. And they asked for, the, the, the military nurses wouldn't, uh, didn't nurse them. I guess they wouldn't, I don't know. Everything was strict. A race was, you know, in 1920, race was, they were still uh, not mixing with them. And, uh, or let them be part of a hospital. They put them in another separate place. And so the Red Cross, they didn't have nurses for these, the, you know, the influenza, the great influenza that swept across the United States like a prairie fire is almost as bad as aid now, other than uh, it killed them faster. And they wouldn't live more than three days with this type of influenza that they had. And in Pensacola, uh, yeah, I mean in Camp Bowie, they just uh, built these barracks uh, where they would uh, be maybe 40 or 50 uh, uh, niggers. They'd be 40 or 50 all falling down. They just fall down with it. They just fall down with influenza. And the, a big part of them died. But as I went in, I, I, I signed up with the Red Cross. That's where the uh, American Red Cross originated. They originated, they originated in 19, during World War I. And they were the greatest organization that ever was ever will be, is the American Red Cross. So I was an Ed, American Red Cross nurse, and the, uh, I volunteered. I was waiting for Navy service, you know, so I uh, agreed that I'd go and stay until I was called to, to service. And so uh, they, um, they called me, they sent me to Fort Worth, this barrack. Well, the day I got there, I got there about, and the only white person I saw was in the office attached to this barracks. And she just took my name and things like that. We didn't have any uh, real nursing to do. We didn't, I didn't see a doctor. I didn't have assignment. You're just in there to uh, bedside nursing, you know, to help comfort these uh, sick. So I walked in and everybody was screaming and delirious and sick and very little care. They had uh, corpsmen, you know, that were nursing them. And they couldn't, uh, they were so busy taking out the dead to the morgue, they couldn't, they did very little, they got very little care. And, uh, but this one nigger was calling for his, uh, his, um, or his sweetheart in Alabama or someplace, I think Alabama, calling for her. Oh, he was just pleading. I hope she comes. Oh, surely Becky will come. Surely she'll come. And I couldn't help but go up to him, you know. When I got up there, he grabbed my hand. Oh, he said, I knew you'd come. I just knew you'd come. Oh, and he just prayed and screamed and, and, and the kind of love uh, tones, you know, words. And so I scared to death. He's holding my hand and he's holding it so tight. I was afraid a supervisor, somebody, come by and see me holding that black man's hand. And, uh, but I couldn't ever get it loose. He just held on to it. So I, I, I thought, well, I'm just going to make, you know, I just, I said, well, uh, I'm glad I come to, and, and now you go to sleep, and you be quiet, and I'll stay here with you. And oh, uh, he went on and on. And so suddenly, holding my hand, he just fell back and died. And I learned a lesson from that. I learned a lesson that I, I, I insisted in all of my work, touch a dying person some way, hold their hand, or, or hold, put their brow, because they have this fleeting moments of consciousness, you know, 
they know somebody's there that loves them. And now he died happy. He thought I was just, uh, he was just delirious and, and dying and he probably couldn't see or anything. He just able to scream and, and feel. He could feel my hand. So I always appreciated that. I appreciated that. And when I, in my supervision, I never let a patient die by themselves. I'd always assign. I said, now you hold their hand. You hold their hand. Or you uh, occasionally touch their brow and say something sweet to them. You say it. Because you just don't know. And I don't think anyone in the world knows but God. Now you take my brother, my nephew. He's really dying out there. So yesterday I went and he won't eat and everybody tries to make him eat. And I said, now Stanley. And I petted him. I said, now Stanley. Darling, we're not going to ask you to eat anymore. If you want to die this way, I think God will let you die this way. And you just do. And I think I'll talk to doctor and ask him to just let you alone. We'll keep your water, ice tubes in your mouth so it won't get dry. We'll do everything to keep you comfortable. But I said, I'm going to ask doctor to ask everybody to not feed you. So I think that, do you believe that? Or do you believe in all these needles and just keep on going? I don't know. I really don't. Now, if he was out there, they'd have something in his nose. They'd have needles in both arms. Yes, they would. And then they'd have something uh, making him swallow a tube to put food in. And the man is, he, I, I said, do you have much comfort? Are you uncomfortable? No. He says, not too much. I said, you have pain? He said, yes, sometimes. Oh, he just looked terrible. He's dying. But it may take days. So that was one of my best uh, experiences. And so I stayed there and helped organize that morgue, you know. How many soldiers died there at Camp Bowie? Ooh, I couldn't tell you. Thousands. They had many barracks. See, that was just one. Now, were you assigned the black section? Yeah, just to, just particularly black, that's all. No whites, no white nurses, no nothing. I was only white nurse. I didn't see a, they didn't even come to see me. They didn't even associate with me. With the, with the white nurses? No. Why? Oh, because I'm taking care of those niggers, I guess, race, uh, prejudice. Why were you assigned the black section? Because I volunteered with the Red Cross. And that was uh, what they wanted. They wanted a nurse in there. The now, Red Cross did. Yeah, besides you, who was who were, were working with the blacks? Well, I don't know. I didn't go to another barrack. I mean, was there anyone in with no, you and your Nothing parents? but corp men, male nurses, male assistants. And they were black? They were all black. Yeah. Everything was black. How? I, what was their reaction to you? Oh, the just, they, just like I was an angel. Oh, they, they said, I don't know. How come you got to be here? Some of them would say, uh, you're the kindest, prettiest person I ever laid my eyes on. You know, just someone. I'd go to each bed, you know, and say something to them. I'd have something to say where the Negro, their Negro men didn't care. They weren't trained or anything. Now, were they trained nurses, the corpsmen, the, the black? No, men? no, 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 no. They were just lay people, just people. Maybe they were army people, I don't know. So you were the only medical person there? I was the only medical person in there. I never saw a doctor as long as I was there. Never saw a doctor, never saw a doctor. And the only person, I don't know if this woman in the office was a nurse or she was just a, a head of the Red Cross. I think she's head of the Red Cross. She just keeping, uh, keeping uh, score for the Red Cross. How long were you there at Fort Worth? Oh, I think I was there about two weeks. Then where'd you go? And then, 
I, I've always been a little, uh, oh, spend my money and don't know how much I spend, you know. So I'd gone out to dinner a time or two and didn't notice about spending money, didn't think about money. And I'm not, of course, this volunteer work, you, you, you didn't, they didn't pay you anything. And I, uh, oh, when I got those orders, I just flipped to flip, you know. I'd never had anything like that in my life. Ordered me to this big Navy hospital, reimbursed me when I got there. Oh, I was just a walking on air. And uh, I got out the bus station. I was going to go from Fort Worth to Sherman. And I had these Navy orders, you know. She called me in and gave me the orders <coughs> and discharged me. And she wrote something in a book. And so uh, I uh, went up to the uh, window, the bus, to uh, get my ticket. And I think the ticket to Sherman was two or three dollars. You know, then things didn't cost. Uh, and I looked in my purse and I just had a dollar and a half. Well, that frightened me. I was in a strange, I didn't, I couldn't think, I didn't think I knew anyone. And so, uh, I said, it's getting dark, you know. Well, I couldn't sit in that bus station all night. So uh, the, the old Texas hotel wasn't far from the bus station. You know, it was a famous old hotel in Fort Worth. And uh, so I, I just went and registered in. So I told the fella, Kurt, I said, I, I, I started to go to Sherman, but I didn't have enough money. And I said, I can't sit in that bus station all night. And I said, I'd like to stay all night, and uh, in the morning I can get I'll wire for money, and uh, I go wire for you. You know I don't care where you are, or how tough you're having it. The sisters of charity will help you. They'll help you. You know I I I, I just uh, would ask them for whatever I needed. They 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 do it. If you're in trouble. And so uh, I said, I'll get in touch with them. You know, then they trusted you. Oh, he said, that's just fine, just fine. So he gave me a room. I stayed all night. Well, I hadn't had, uh, I, I ate very little. It's summertime. And uh, then by breakfast, whoo, was I getting hungry. And I got up and I had wired, you know, telegraph. Then we used the telegraph. So I had wired the telegraph and uh, to the sisters at St. Vincent, and I told them that I needed the money to get home on. And uh, so just what happened, I don't know, but there was some error made. They made some error, error in my address, getting the, or my address or something. I didn't get the money. Noon time come, and I didn't have any money. So all of a sudden, I thought of, of uh, John Meadow. He was a cousin of the people with whom I was practically raised. And he'd visit there, and he was a druggist in Fort Worth. I don't know why I didn't think of him, you know. I don't know why at all. But it, there he'd come to me. I immediately called him. And he is there, and oh, he just there so as quick as he can get there. So, uh, there's, uh, the money from the sisters still hadn't come. So, he took me out, and we ate, and uh, uh, had her plenty to eat, and uh, then he gave me the money to uh, come back to Sherman. And. Uh, so when I got there, well, the sisters were uh, very disappointed because they had found out that the money had not been delivered. But just all of a sudden, me to think of him, 
Uh, it's just those blunders you make in your youth. Yeah, you've awful nice. Yeah, well, I am. Yes, I, I am, but uh, I'm sure having troubles. Stanley's very, very low. Oh, yes, yeah. Well, you know, he had the cancer of the lamp. He's in a terminal state. No, yeah, he's at his home. Yes, and if I don't see that little boy, I'm going to have a fit. He's the cutest thing. Yeah. Oh, no, no, I got better. Yeah, Dr. Fountain diagnosed me. I have uh, a pulmonary hypertension. Yeah, he's medicating me. Yeah, and uh, I am. It's uh, I was doing better with the last checkup, and I still feel better than that. Uh, he's about to. We're we're looking at the same thing. Yes, I'm going to be better now. When are you coming? You think you now? Now you come. Say maybe we'll just uh, uh, rent a, a some a hotel, have us a party. Uh, don't you think that'd be fun? Just and, and just, uh, just uh, let her let her hair down. Oh yeah, we'll all be yeah be merry and bright. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to. I'm just going to stay in here and take care of myself. I've been straining myself uh, uh, with stress with about standing out. I just loved him so much. He's so sweet to me. And I just lost all my friends. And uh, yesterday I just kind of fell apart. His granddaughter's been visiting him in California, and she's just a doll. Yeah. And so, well, we look forward to that Christmas. And uh, uh, I'm going to stay with my uh, doctor. Yeah. Okay. Huh. Joe, do you want to say any more to Kay? Um, yeah. Yeah, I want to say a little more. Uh, I'm supposed to go to Bartlesville tomorrow, but I may not try because I hear it's snowing pretty bad up there. Yeah, so uh, I'll just come on in the office in the morning. Then. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, she's going to come down about Christmas. Well, good. And uh, Betty, her, her mother, mm -hmm. oh, she's my, she's just like my own. Oh, I love her, I love her. Well, I'm sorry I don't have all of my wonderful um, awards. I got a, a award, a State American Legion, I wrote the history of uh, post 148, mm -hmm. and in the contest it won first in the state, and won fifth nationally. And I got some awards on it, but I don't have any place to put them in these little old apartments, you know. But those are my treasured ones. That's a sheepskin. Mm -hmm. That's the reason it's kept. Yes. That's the reason. Um, so you went to Florida? I went to, <clears throat> I got these orders. And I, I really do have a lot of nerve. But I, I'm innocent in, in these things. I. I I just want to do them, and I think it's all right. So I, it order says uh, report to Pensacola Naval Hospital a certain certain, but it didn't say a certain time. It said, and you will be 
reimbursed for all your expenses. For your expenses, it didn't say all. And uh, for your expenses. So I thought, well, oh, I, you know, they, then they had an advertisement out, join the Navy and see the world. And I think that's why I joined it. I wanted to see the world. And uh, that was whole, my whole uh, idea about it. And uh, so I, I, I did. I came to Raw and uh, saw my parents and got me enough money. I had a little money in the bank and I got enough money to, for a ticket and for any expenses I might have. So I had a friend in, um, in, uh, oh, in East Texas, Bonham. I had a friend in Bonham who um, wanted me to, was going to have a big party for me. And, um, okay, I said, well, I'll just stay all night. So I stayed all night in Bonham. And I thought, well, it won't make any difference. They don't, you know, I never thought about uh, time en route. And uh, I, uh, next morning, I caught this, uh, the train. I had a Pullman ticket. Got on the Pullman and uh, to New Orleans. That was my next uh, change. And, uh, of course, we, then we had to ferry across the river, you know. And uh, that was exciting. And um, and I thought, well, I'll just, uh, I just, it's dark, dreary and dark and foggy and all. And I thought, well, I just believe I'll just go to the hotel and stay all night. Just some historical hotel. I just wanted to see New Orleans. So I go to the hotel and um, I asked the taxi driver. He drove an old, he, he drove an old flipper-like car, you know. Looked like an old Ford, oh, one of those old, old Fords. Well, that was a taxi. So he took me, I asked him, I said, now what's the, the leading, most uh, leading hotel? And said, well, he says St. Charles. He says it's very historic. I said, well, take me to St. Charles. So he took me to St. Charles. I got in, I registered in, just like I was Miss Astor, and uh, they assigned me in a very old uh, Civil War days, you know, those posted beds with the drapes and all. Well, I just thought that was great to be there. So I got up next morning, and oh, they had a wonderful dining room, and all the niggers were just shining. They just, skin was shining, and they're suits were so white and perfect, you know. It was just uh, almost glitter to me. And so I had a nice big breakfast, and I think my train left about nine for Pensacola. And I got the train to Pensacola, 